Uh, welcome to to all of you. It's a, a great cross section of, uh, of 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 the world. Um, my name is Esther Mary Darcy, and I am the chair of the European Region of World Physiotherapy. And all of you are welcome here this evening. Um, and indeed, it may not be evening for for some of you, uh, looking at where you're coming from. This webinar is the latest in a series of webinars that the, the working groups of the European region of world physiotherapy have been hosting. So we have three working groups, education matters, advocacy and EU matters. And this one is being led by the professional practice working group. And this evening's session covers the really important issue of advanced practice and its development within our, our profession. Um, advanced practice, I think, is in itself is hard to define, and um, I know that it does not translate easily into some languages. So hopefully the webinar uh, will help here um, as we will be looking at, at what it is and what is not. There are many different ways to approach advanced practice. And this evening, we're delighted to be bringing you examples of models from, from colleagues in, in member organizations um, of the Swedish Association, uh, the CSP in the UK, KNGF in the Netherlands, the Irish Association and the US Association, the APTA. I hope that you will benefit from the experience of our colleagues. And I thank um, the Professional Practice Working Group um, and the leads in these webinars, Alex McKenzie and Neerit Rotem, to whom I now hand over to chair the session. Thank you, Esther Mary, and welcome everyone. Good evening. Uh, thank you for joining us today uh, for our webinar. Advanced practice physiotherapy is defined uh, usually as a level of practice within the physiotherapy professions, profession that involves advanced knowledge, clinical reasoning, and decision-making skill, as well as the ability to work autonomously and uh, in collaboration with other healthcare professionals. ESCO, which is the European Skills Competences, Qualifications and Occupations cl Classification of Skills, even has an, have an extensive list of skills and competencies required of an advanced uh, practice physio, in which uh, the professional practice uh, group took part in Italy. While many countries have formal advanced physiotherapy practice, others do not, and many are in the process of establishing it. So this evening, we will hear from representatives of some countries about their experience and about the models they use, and they will be here to answer your questions after short presentations. Please use uh, chat if you have any questions, and Alex, which will be moderating with me, will bring them in. At the end of all presentations, we'll have time for answers and for discussion. So uh, we'll start with uh, uh, Sweden and Dr. Charlotte Krusander, who is a healthcare strategist working with professional issues and specialist education in the Swedish Association. So Charlotte, please tell us about your experience. Well, thank you, nice to be here. So, <clears throat> uh, so uh, since 1993, the Swedish Association of Physiotherapists regulate, administrate and certify specialists in physiotherapy. Uh, physiotherapy. And the specialist education is a three year education based on four pillars clinical work and the supervision in the area of specialization corresponding to about 75% of a full-time work. And the remaining 25% should contain a one-year master, theoretical deepening in the area of specialization and a quality improvement work. And there are 17 specialist areas, for example, orthopedics, elderly care, intensive care, and mental health. And for each area, there's a study guide defining learning outcomes or competences. And the study guide also gives examples of learning activities. So the supervisor and the specialist stu student make up a three year study plan based on the study guide. And the study plan is reviewed by a committee before he or she is accepted to start the education. 
And the committee also reviews the specialist application after the three year education. And today about 10% or 1500 uh, physiotherapists are specialists. The specialists are uneven distributed, both regarding the area of specialization and geographically in the country, with the vast majority in the bigger cities. And pros with the model. So beside being an expert in the clinical setting, the specialists are also ready to take on roles in leadership and in the development of care. And benefits for the patient and service. So. Uh, reducing waiting lists, effective care, person-centered care. And for the physiotherapist, it can or should offer a career pathway, higher salary and recognition from society. And costs, it's a comprehensive education. It takes a lot of time and effort to become a specialist. And barriers today, uh, this, the number one, is regulation. So we want the state or the National Board of Health and Welfare, Welfare to regulate the title. And we want more patients and employers who inquire specialists. So thank you. That's all for me. Thank you, Charlotte. And maybe if uh, um, we can ask you just for now, what, are, what would you say are the big uh, lessons from the, the development of uh, specializations over the what, many years you've got, the main. Yeah, it, uh, one, one tricky bit is to, to get people to uh, the society, the employers to know about that there are specialists in physiotherapy. And another thing is, um, that we have, we have changed the focus from being what physiotherapists can do to what do healthcare need. So that's a shift in in the yeah how how what, what the specialist should should offer. Thank you, Alex. Are there any questions coming in yet? Okay, so we'll move on to uh, Rina Patel from the UK. She is Assistant Director of Workforce and Education at the Chartered Society of Physiotherapy, who provides st strategic leadership for the quality assurance of pre and post registration physiotherapy education, student, student experience, and workforce development across the United Kingdom. Rina, you have a very different model uh, in the UK, right? Thank, thank you, Nirith. Yes. And also there's variation across the countries in the UK as well. So uh, the UK is made up of England, Northern Ireland, Scotland and Wales, and there's variation. So I'll, I'll speak to that as, as, I, as I go through. So the long term plan, which was published in 2019, um, outlines a vision of the National Health Service across the UK that is more joined up and coordinated. It is more proactive in the service it provides and more differentiated in its support for individuals. Meeting these goals means transforming the NHS workforce by reshaping our teams around the needs of our populations. And the plan puts advanced practitioners as a, as a key role in this transformation across acute primary community and social care. So over the last decade, various strategic policies have been published aimed at standardising expectations of advanced practice across the health and care sectors, providing assurance of the capabilities and competence of individuals across all four countries of the UK. So a key driver for the implementation of advanced clinical practice is to enable practitioners to practice to their full potential and to optimise their contribution to meeting population, individual, family and carer needs through different models of service delivery and multidisciplinary working. There are currently no consistent systematic measures to capture the number of people working at an advanced level of practice across the, the countries of the UK, uh, across healthcare organisations and sectors. In terms of how the scope of practice has evolved in, in the UK, uh, the, the profession secured professional autonomy in 1977, and it was some uh, 30 years later 
where the CSP, the Chartered Society of Physiotherapy, agreed a new definition of scope of practice, which makes it clear that associated activities such as the use of various diagnostic resources, prescribing and injection therapy are linked to the more are within the scope of physiotherapy. So as Neera described earlier, there's no definition of advanced practice that is both standardised and accepted across the UK. Advanced practice is level of practice rather than a specific role. But what we do have across the UK are four separate framework documents reflecting the, the, the four countries of the UK. These were developed with the aim of providing practical guidance on non-medical workforce development to ensure services continue to meet evolving patient needs. So although the differing frameworks have, all the frameworks have differing content, they all provide the following. They provide the capabilities that are required across the four pillars of advanced level practice. These are clinical, leadership, education and research. They, they outline the education and support requirements for advanced level practice, and they provide advice for employers with regards to planning and implementation. Within the framework of all four countries of the UK, the necessary education provision to support working at an advanced level of practice is stated to be master's level or equivalent. The CSP advocates for multiple and flexible routes through which individuals can develop capabilities. These include work-based learning, access to high quality courses and modules, along with higher level apprenticeship programs in England and traditional master's degree programs. I'm going to speak more specifically about the England offer now. So in England, to address the variation in education, a centre for advancing practice to support and develop nationally agreed education and training standards has been created. A similar or alternative approach to addressing education standardisation has not yet been published in the other nations of the UK. In England, the multi-professional advanced clinical practice framework sets out a new and bold vision in developing this critical workforce in a consistent way to ensure safety, quality and effectiveness. It has been developed for use across all settings, including primary, community, acute mental health and learning disabilities. This framework requires that health and care professionals, it's, it's multidisciplinary, multi-professional, are working at the level of advanced clinical practice, should have developed and can evidence the underpinning competences applicable to their speciality or subject area, i.e. the knowledge, skills and behaviours relevant to the physiotherapist setting and job role. The core capabilities across the four pillars of clinical leadership, education and research are then applied to these specialist competencies. How these are demonstrated will vary depending on the profession, the role, the population group, setting and sector. A key work stream for the Centre for Advancing Practice is to oversee the development and quality assurance of multi-professional advanced practice credentials to address high priority at scale workforce development needs. Credentials are used to describe standardised structured units of assessed learning that are designed to develop advanced level practice capability in a particular area. And these credential specifications are intended for delivery by education providers. Credential specifications include some of the following areas, acute medicine, community-based rehabilitation, end-of-life care, learning disability, mental health, older people, pelvic health, public health. So the Centre for Advancing Practice have developed these credentials that are specific to these, these, these patient um, pathways of care. So to finish, really, um, advanced practice embodies the ability to manage clinical care, deal with complexity, multimorbidity. It offers continued continuity of care for patients, for individuals, families and carers. It enables innovative solutions to improve service user experience and outcomes. And it also allows redistribution of workloads within a multidisciplinary team, building decision making capabilities. This helps clinicians stay, this helps great clinicians stay in clinical roles as their career progresses. And evidence consistently shows that well-planned multi-professional working is more effective and satisfying for the workforce with the potential to improve retention rates across staff groups and patient care. Thank you. Thank you, Rena. 
Alex, any, any questions coming in yet? Good. So we'll go on and uh, we'll hear from Dr. Mario Mir from Ireland, who is current and advanced practice officer with the Irish Society of Physiotherapy and uh, incoming CEO. So good luck in your, in your new job. And uh, the, the Irish, uh, as far as I know, have gone the way the UK has done things, basically, uh, if I'm correct. What, yes, why, yeah. why did you decide to go competency-based model? Well, what, what, what has happened in the Ireland situation is we've had clinical specialism since about 2000. But as soon as we developed clinical specialism, practitioners started pushing the bar moving into advanced practice straight away so we've had people working with advanced scope of practice for over 22 years now in Ireland you have we currently have three grades that you work at staff grade senior and clinical specialist but we're advocating and negotiating with the department of health our government around creating an advanced practice grade so it'll be another grade above we don't see advanced practitioners necessarily as being specialists they can be generalists many of them will work in community care will have general skills and others will go through a specialism route uh, what we felt was looking particularly on what they had gone through that we wanted to work around a competency framework as well it seemed to work very well for them our members were looking for specific competencies to guide them in practice and we looked internationally what was happening and we decided to use a four pillar model. We felt this was quite simple and easy to use, but also we have a lot of staff who move between Ireland and the UK, who train in the UK, work, train in the UK, come back to Ireland. So to facilitate that movement of staff, we felt it was best to use a similar four pillar model. So our four pillars are, again, clinical practice, leadership and management, education and facilitation of learning and research and development of evidence. Um, so what happened initially with advanced practice in Ireland was very much around role substitution and specific tasks. And there is a lot of confusion between what is specialism and what is advanced practice. So we have adopted the ER world physio definition of, work, of advanced practice. And what I say to people who ask me, am I a specialist or am I an advanced practitioner? I say it no longer is task based. For example, around you, the use of injection therapy, anybody can learn and do the course to become an injection therapist, but being able to perform the task does not make you an advanced practitioner. An advanced practitioner is somebody with a high level of autonomy, high level of responsibility, can participate in very involved clinical decision making and knows when to use the task in the care. So we would say, for example, with injection therapy, that the practitioner would see and assess the patient, realize they need the injection, be able to prescribe the injection, perform the injection, and then do the follow up afterwards. So there is a nice definition of advanced practice actually from our nursing colleagues in Ireland, where they say a specialist is responsible for a discrete, highly specialized aspect of care, but the advanced practitioner is responsible for the whole of the episode of care. And that's very much the model in Ireland. At the moment, we have about 8% of our workforce are in public health are working at clinical specialist level and about 4% are working at an advanced practice level. We hope to grow that to 8% nationally. We have one national, we, we are slightly different to the UK in that uh, we've been very influenced by what's happened in the UK. In the UK, a lot of services developed organically and the service that I developed in was service driven locally. But we also have national clinical programs that are delivering advanced practice as a national program. So, for example, we have 65 uh, practitioners who are working in the area of orthopedic and rheumatology triage. They are primarily hospital based, but are now moving into the community. And to date, in 12 years, they have managed more than 200,000 patients by themselves independently and um, with only about 20 percent of those needing a consultant follow-up so i suppose the beauty of having national coordinated programs like this is that we have national data we're rolling out the similar again for respiratory for community care for copd and pulmonary rehab and creating national care hubs and again our not our advanced practice is very look we're advocating for a lot of legislative change to promote our advanced practice. We can't yet prescribe medicines, but we're advocating to prescribe medicines as advanced practitioners. And we're advocating that it'll become 
um, a recognized clinical grade. We see the benefit of, of, it, of this, just as Reen has said, of keeping people within the profession, of keeping highly skilled clinicians within the profession, and allowing them to develop their own career pathway rather than forcing them to go into management or in, into some other area because they want to advance their skills. But again, advanced practice in Ireland is master's based. You have to have a master's to be at this clinical level. When we get the grade, we are proposing that we will have a very specific, distinct education pathway where you will have to do an advanced practice master's to be allowed to apply for a post. Whereas we, though we do have 4% working that level already, the vast majority of them have masters, but they will almost have to grandparent into those roles by providing portfolios to show how they meet the other three pillars as well. Because advanced practice is not just about a clinical role. The other three pillars are just as important because we need our physios to participate in research, to be leaders and to take students and educate those around them. So thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so we'll have the questions, uh, but you have, you've had the privilege or, or the benefit of actually uh, enjoying UK uh, experience and building Exactly. Yeah, so we've watched what's developed in the UK and then try to develop national clinical programs around the same area. We've watched them um, develop their competency frameworks and then are, because we have we have lots of staff come back from the NHS who say they want to work at this level in Ireland. So we said the best way to facilitate movement of staff was to have a similar framework. And we found, and people said to us that framework for, worked very well. So that's why we've adopted it. So it is competency based, but will be based on master's level of education as well. Okay, thanks. So uh, if we we ended with uh, education, we'll uh, hear from Jose Mirhoff, who is manager of quality policy uh, department at the KNGF, the Dutch, uh, society, Dutch Royal Society uh, for Physiotherapy. So, Hus, please go ahead. Nira, thank you very much. And colleagues, thanks for the interesting talks because it's nice to hear of all of the different policies in the different countries within or outside of the scope of the European region. Um, from the Dutch perspective, um, my presentation is mostly about specialization because we are not that far in the advanced practice yet, but I will end with what we are doing in the advanced practice. Oh, now I'm in, in the, the central mode as well. So I'm talking to myself very big. Well, um, so our specialization started in uh, the early 80s, 1980s. Um, and at this moment we have, we, uh, um, distinguish three levels of physiotherapists. The one is the bachelor's qualification on a European qualifications framework of uh, six. And then we have a post bachelor's degree, uh, which is also a EQF six level. And we have a master's program specialization. Obviously there is a route of um, researchers who do their PhD, but PhD is not a, a separate title for our clinical uh, work um, and first to zoom in on the the, the, the bachelors we have there's an, an act from a national level which has been in place since 93 which promotes uh, uh, and monitors the quality of uh, professional activities and obviously it protects the patient from incompetency and negli negligent actions of practitioners um, in our bachelors we have uh, work um, requirement of two, oh, a little over 2,000 hours every five year. This is only the working requirement. And since 1997, we have our, from the association, we have uh, added continuous professional development obligations. And um, uh, before that, before 1997, we had several specializations. Manual therapy is the oldest one, uh, oldest speci specialty we have. Uh, by now we have uh, just over 10 uh, different specializations um, and this is also this is on um, a master's level and what we see um, in uh, the Netherlands right now is that the ex what we call um, extended scope which is a sort of what I think you use uh, uh, well you are calling advanced practice in which we 
um, are seeking for um, well, a, an extended scope with regard to referral and prescription. Um, physiotherapists are already educated to be an extended scope specialist, but it's not ready. Uh, uh, it is not recognized yet by our government and insurance companies to get paid for. Um, on the other hand, on the specialist level, we have like uh, the uh, the substitution effect from, for example, claudication intermittent intermittent claudication, vascular problem in the legs. That uh, if you have a uh, specialist degree on the bachelor's level, um, you get a higher reimbursement rate from insurance companies. But there is no difference in. Um, uh, the qualification well in in the things you've learned during your education and what we are seeking for right now what we're advocating for and i must admit on which we have big debates within our association is the extended scope um in which referral is uh, broader and prescription we hope to get um, within several years but still there is also a lot of debate within the uh, association that why should uh, or what should be the, uh, um, the, the the extended skills you need to require before you get this extended scope. So that's actually what we are having right now, mostly focusing on specialization and only starting off with the uh, advanced practice, focusing on the extended scope. Thank you very much. Thank you, Hus. <clears throat> um, so, Last but not least is we are uh, happy to have Tara Jomanal, Dr. Tara Jomanal, who is Vice President of Scientific Affairs at the American Physical Therapy Association, which includes APTA Journal and Physical Therapy and Rehabilitation Journal, the Learning Center and PT Practice, and Innovation. Her previous 30 years was spent as Director of Clinical Services and Residency Training and Professor of Physical Therapy at the University of Delaware. We are excited to have Tara with us to talk about advanced practice of physical therapy uh, in the USA. So Tara, please. Thank you very much. Um, I'm actually also excited to hear um, everyone else's take and, and the angles and directions that they've taken on this because um, as Host just mentioned, you know, some of us are going in an, in the other direction now as well. So, so we've done one thing and now we're looking at what it means to do something else. So that's been super helpful to me. I have so many notes I've taken all over my desk while you were all talking. So thank you. Um, so we've had um, certified specialty um, in areas since the late 80s. Um, and cardiovascular and pulmonary would be one of the earliest as well as clinical electrophysiology. Um, originally, the design was that it, it would be Voluntary, um, and it would not. It would be unrestricted, meaning that it didn't mean you couldn't practice in that area if you didn't have one. But it would be intended to give um, some description of an advanced clinical knowledge, experience, and skills in certain areas. However, over our um, many years of doing this, that that actually has happened where it's been used to separate in some ways. And two ex good examples would be clinical electrophysiology. Although in many states you can do a clinical electrophysiological exam without board specialization, our um, government payment, Medicare, won't pay for it unless it's done by a board certified electrophysiologist or under the supervision of one. Um, so that's a place where it wasn't intended, but now it's being used that way. Sports is another example. There are many locations where you can't cover live events if you're not sports certified. Um, and again, that's now separating out your ability and it's linking it to the specialization, but that's being done by the community, not being done by the specialization academy itself. Um, and so it's a 10-year certification um, in those multiple areas. Our most recent one that just um, started was wound management, and that just brought its first class in um, in this um, in the um, in February. Um, and it costs about fourteen hundred dollars in order to take the specialization. If you're not a member, it would be more like twenty four hundred. Um, and so then we also asked ourselves, what's the return on investment? Um, and we recently just did a survey and identified that. Uh, physical therapists that are board certified are making about $4,500 a year 
more than non-certified specialists. So we actually are seeing it um, trickle into the payment realm. 53% um, of employers paid at least some cost associated with getting the specialization, and 43% of employers are giving priority and job hiring to applicants who are board certified. So we're starting to now collect the data on the back end to see what does it mean and, and you know, where's the advantage. Um, interestingly, we have a relationship between board certification and residency and fellowship training. It's not a required pathway, but it's um, it's linked. Um, and so what we see is most um, all um, residents, graduate um, residents in our in residency programs go on to take board specialization. It's usually the pinnacle of having completed the residency but it's not the only pathway to become board certified. Um, however, we find residents pass at around 94% and the general physical therapy population following specialization passes at a 77% rate. So what that's actually showing us is that those who are residency trained pass the exam um, for specialization at a higher rate. It's also a fast track. They can actually become eligible to sit for the board specialization sooner than someone who's not going through a residency program. So there are a couple advantages um, to using the residency pathway, um, but our residency pathway is also growing. We only have 7,000 um, residency trained individuals in the United States now, um, and we're looking at graduating around 700 a year. So that's certainly not the only pathway. We have 30,000 board certified specialists in the States, um, and that's fi about 15% of all physical therapists licensed in the United States. So um, the, the residency pathway is not big enough um, to feed the whole system, but it certainly is um, likely a fast track um, and probably gets you there um, with a little greater success. Um, so that's really where we have been in the specialty um, um, process. And interestingly, we're now talking about um, feasibility of what it means for advanced practice and pathways for advanced practice and how are they similar and how are they different. So again, hearing all of the, the different perspectives is really is very helpful. To get a board certification in, or in a specialty area, a description of specialty practice has to be created. And that has to be a vetted and validated tool that says these are the pieces of knowledge, skills, and abilities that would go into that specialization. And then that would then lead to the exam um, that's taken. And then after that, you have 10 years before you recertify. Every three years, you have to demonstrate certain levels of clinical judgment and practice. And then in the 10th year, it's another exam in order to maintain your certification for the next 10 years. So that's been our process since the 80s, um, pretty much in the States. And um, you have residencies, which you talked about. Uh, are they, uh, is there any oversight by the APTA or is it on a state level? How is it uh, yeah. managed and developed? So both groups have oversight um, from the American Physical Therapy Association. One is the American Board of Physical Therapy Specialties, and that is a division of the American Physical Therapy Association. And so that oversees the uh, description of specialty practice and its validation, as well as the exam development and the maintenance of specialty certification. That's that every three year um, pathway that you need to go to in order to maintain your specialization. That's all overseen um, at the level of the American Physical Therapy Association. Concurrently, um, we have our, um, our uh, overseeing group, which is the American Board of Physical Therapy Residency and Fellowship Education Group. So that is separate from the board specialization group, but also a division of the American Physical Therapy Association. And that group accredits residency programs. So that involves everything from um, a submission of uh, uh, application as well as description of all the behaviors and, and expectations and rules and content as well as site visits, um, et cetera. And then that requires annual updates to maintain that um, accreditation of an individual site. So those are also accredited by a subdivision. So I think we've heard many uh, options or ways to go about it. Uh, Alex, I saw Ash had uh, put up a, a, it's a, a question with you for all the panelists. Yeah. So um, the question is, uh, what are the perceptions of the public on advanced practice roles of physios versus medical colleagues? 
do you feel that the general public understands the physio roles in the advanced practice space? I'll take this one, Alex, actually, because I've done my PhD on advanced practice and I've worked as an advanced practice practitioner. So I suppose I've got I've looked at this a little bit in my PhD. I would say as somebody who worked in advanced practice for 12 years, in my title very clearly, I would say who I was, what I was doing, what my role was in every appointment. And a lot of patients would still say, thank you, doctor, at the end of the appointment. Um, so I, I think there is a grow, there is a need for a growing awareness in this area that physios are moving into this area. However, from PhD research in Ireland, both in pediatrics and in adults, we look specifically at um, patient satisfaction with the area through um, qualitative studies, through surveys and through um, through focus group questions. It was explained very clearly to all the people who had seen the, the practitioners where they were, and they all said they were as happy, if not happier, to have seen a physiotherapist rather than a doctor. And they felt that they got a better service than if they had seen a doctor. So when they understood clearly, they all accepted it. What I also would say is, so I, as part of my PhD, I did a study as well to cost, to see how it was a contingent valuation study to see what would people be prepared to pay to see an advanced practice practitioner. So they were, and it both for adults and children. So they were given, we had about 600 participants. They were given various scenarios of what people typically present to the different clinics were. Um, and the average price they were willing to pay was 400 euros for an appointment. The average cost of an appointment with an advanced practice practitioner in Ireland is 25 euros. And the average cost of a doctor's appointment in, in for a similar triage type appointment is over 55 euros. But they were willing to pay over 400 euros. And they, most of them said that they were they would happily see a physiotherapist who was highly skilled to avoid a waiting list. So it was waiting time that they were willing to pay to avoid. Uh, Hus, what, what would you say in uh, Holland is the perception of the public on advanced practice roles? Well, more or less. You, you're, we hate now, now you're gone. Now you muted yourself. Thank you. Yeah, I have a problem with my sound on my computer. So I'm, okay. I'm logged in twice. Uh, now, I would say it's more or less the same as in Ireland, uh, although the, the price of 400 euros will probably not be paid in the Netherlands. But uh, now what we see is that. Um, uh, uh, patients are happy to visit their physiotherapists and they know that it's the physiotherapist that they, so they won't say thank you doctor but they are aware of the fact that um, with their um, complaints to to the uh, related to uh, movement um, they are better off visiting their PT than they are uh, visiting their um, GP because of uh, a lack of time at the GP and not only the time, but uh, patients know and feel that there's more knowledge on the domain we are specialized in at the PT than the GP. So um, uh, in general, what we see is that they are happy to visit their physiotherapists and they are uh, they know that they are well off. And, and the other thing is compared to the medical specialist services in the Netherlands is that it's um, easier to reach out to your PT than it is to get in contact with an orthopedic surgeon or whatever specialist. Um, uh, so now it's well accepted that the PTs have a, a, a prominent role within our healthcare, which is also uh, stated quite often on the, the big news items. And uh, obviously, which also helps a lot to become recognized as specialists um, is the recognition of the sportsmen and women in within our country. Um, so now I would say um, it's mostly like uh, Marie explained in, in Ireland. Would you say uh, who's that the public knows when to go to a specialist or to an advanced practice physio rather than a generalist? Would do they have a, or how? What's the perception about? No, that's a good. Not, not in comparison to the GP, but to generalist uh, physio. Um, well, there are some, uh, then 
if I go back to the way we look at advanced practice, then advanced practice in, in, in the sense of extended scope with regard to referral and medication uh, prescription is not recognized broadly, um, but the specialization is recognized broadly a long time. And what we see is the longer you are a recognized specialist, the better you are uh, known as a specialist. So, for example, manual therapy in the Netherlands is... I would, I, I mean, obviously it's not everyone, but most of the uh, general population know the difference between a manual therapist and a physiotherapist. And what we see is um, a rising star in the Netherlands is the, the, the cardiorespiratory specialist, um, which is known by the patient category it uh, represents or it helps. Um, but then there are some of the younger and one other a good example is the pediatric physiotherapist obviously everyone knows and recognizes their specialty but there are some uh, smaller um, specialists which are not really known yet so uh, psychosomatic specialization we have and i would say it's not known at all um, so it, it differs on the range of specialists we have and uh, with regard to it, it advanced practice, extended scope. Um, we are not so as, as far as some of the other countries are uh, within this webinar. Thanks. Now, Tara, how, what would you say about the perception of the public in the US? Yeah, so we just recently did a, um, a consumer survey and one of the things that we found, so so in the states, um, it took a while, but um, each individual states, you know, control the practice in that area. So there's a lot, a lot of hurdles to get through to get all the states, you know, doing the same thing. And so we now have direct access in all states, which means someone can go to a physiotherapist without a referral from a physician, as an example. Um, mm -hmm. And yet, in a recent study that we just did on a consumer survey. They loved their physical therapist. They loved the evaluation that they got. They thought it was the most comprehensive thing they probably ever gotten. And yet they would still prefer that a physician make the recommendation for them to come. So although their experience is positive, even having had the positive experience didn't change the fact that they felt like the other individual would probably be the one to recommend it if needed, rather than they would seek it independently. So we definitely have a lot more work to do just in the field itself um, to allow people to understand the access opportunities they have because they have the access, they're not even using it. Um, and so we realized that that's certainly something we're going to be working on now more than ever. And what would you say the physician's perception on physiotherapy specialist. Uh... Yeah, that's actually where we're headed next because one of the things is if this is the point that the, that the patients think that the physician needs to refer us, then we need to make sure the physicians recognize what we have to offer or mm -hmm. those referrals won't happen. So we're actually working um, towards that right now um, to make sure that we understand more. However, you know, anecdotally, having been in, in the field for 30 years and, and having a full clinical practice within that, that I oversaw as well at the university, um, the experience and the depth of those relationships are often based on shared mutual opportunities with patients, right? So the more you work with physicians, with their patients, the more they are, they're like, oh, we got to call them. Sometimes to your negative that you get all the difficult cases because they need help. <laughs> now you're the go-to. Um, so we know that there's serious pockets of strong relationships and strong mutual understanding. The question is, are we at the level of the average GP, general practitioner, referring patients or um, recognizing the value, or is there is that the place we need to spend more time? Thanks. Alex is uh, saying there are more questions coming in. Alex, please. Yeah, so there's uh, there's one that kind of links to another one as well, where they're asking about the, the are the general public uh, aware that these kind of specialists um, exist uh, or what's being done to educate about that um, which is sort of a link to another question that came in to say you know where can people get information on that on their kind of situation as to as to how to access uh, Rina uh, could you tell us about what it's like in the UK yeah so I suppose there's a, a broader question isn't it about how is physiotherapy generally perceived by the general population and then how is advanced practice perceived uh, in, in in sort of as part of that as well 
Um, and I think in response to uh, apologies if I don't pronounce this correctly, but Marcel's question around um, where do people get information and who to turn to, I think that's a really good question because uh, it's quite it's quite hard for a service user to navigate that. But from um, a UK perspective, generally speaking, you would see an advanced practitioner via some form of triage. So either it would be via a, 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 a sort of physiotherapy um, intervention where it's determined that they need to be seen by an advanced practitioner, or it might be via um, a GP access um, and so it's always done through triage. I, I don't know of many instances where that first contact would happen directly from patient to advanced practitioner, unless you know that that's embedded within the within the service already, or that service user has seen that advanced practitioner in the past and then has got that contact. So um, I think it varies, and it will depend on on what what the local arrangements are within that service. Thanks. And Charlotte, how is it in Sweden? Do they, uh, the public, is the public or patients aware of the specialist and where do they get information about it? So the awareness in the public is quite low. Uh, we do some advocacy work against patient organizations. And from, from them, we heard that, that they really embrace the specialization and then they want their patient groups to to be able to meet the specialist and we also we also recognize a growing interest uh, of specialization by employers and on other healthcare professionals and if you or to work as a private practitioner in the stockholm the the capital of sweden then you need to be a certified specialist but even though the, the public are not aware that they meet the specialist. So there's a lot of work to do to, uh, to, to, uh, to increase the, the, the public awareness. Okay, it seems like in, in, in most countries, that's, that's uh, the way it is, a lot of work to do with public awareness. And um, we talked that, uh, that the goal of, uh, uh, specialization or advanced practice is to improve practice uh, or care. Um, do we really know that uh, we are achieving it? Is there anything who's in, in the Netherlands, you, you, with your registry, you know, outcome measures you follow? Uh, did you do any comparison between gen, uh, uh, specialists and generalists? Yes, well, we actually start, just started a project in comparing um, the manual therapy and the physiotherapy. Uh, and uh, the results are not known yet. Um, uh, but yes, we first, let's talk a little bit about our clinical registry, which is a registry which, in which uh, over 15,000 physical therapists in the Netherlands collect data from their clinical process. So they have their electronic health record system, which is connected to, um, um, well, let's say a cloud in which we store the data. Um, and this data is used for um, quality improvement purposes, scientific research and lobbying activities. Um, for, by now we have over 11 million unique patient episodes over which we collected the data of these PTs who participate. And obviously this provides an enormous opportunity to do such comparisons. Um, but there's all, there are all sorts of interests uh, in place. And um, so for now we do a, 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 just an exercise to make a comparison between manual therapy and physiotherapy uh, in patients with low back pain to see number of treatments and all sorts of, all sorts of different um, uh, outcomes. For example, one of the uh, outcomes on which we compare is uh, in the Netherlands, uh, a manual therapist can only receive the higher reimbursement scheme if he or she provides manual therapy. And what we see within this system, because it's not, you cannot really check if manual therapy or just basic physiotherapy is given by a manual therapist. And what we know and what we see is that all 
uh, let me correct, not all, but uh, a lot of these um, manual therapists, I've been uh, one my, myself, uh, uh, followed an expensive education for 20,000 euros. And you most of the time you use your, uh, you, you, you reimburse the money you get as a manual therapist. So we also compare uh, along the lines of, uh, well, financial interest. Um, and yes, we have started these comparisons, but again, it is quite difficult because before you know it, you start an, a very intense discussion, which merely focuses on your inner uh, world uh, and we uh, rather spend the, 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 the valuable time that we have to look out uh, look outside and uh, present the added value of physiotherapy in general to the Dutch population. Thanks. So how, what's the experience in other in the other countries about uh, how uh, uh, specialization or advanced practice actually affected a pay for physiotherapists? And uh, if you have any data on, on workforce retention, which is uh, such a big issue nowadays. Mm -hmm. uh, Mary? Yeah. Yes, Nero. So I think the question isn't how do you compare advanced practice physiotherapy to regular physiotherapy, because it's a different level of practice. And the practitioners who are doing it are generally much more experienced. They're out 10, 15, 20 years. And they're probably managing much more complex patients than a, a new graduate or a staff. So I, I, I so we have done a lot of data on this. So we've done, we've had two PhDs looking at advanced practice just nationally recently. And what we've done is done a lot of work comparing because these are, we're managing patients that are normally seen by consultants. Generally in advanced practice, you're managing a patient that is going down a consultant route, but you're taking them on a physiotherapy route instead. So what we've done is we've looked at physiotherapy, advanced practice physiotherapy to usual medical care. And we have shown that the diagnosis is equivalent. The need for use of investigations, we actually order less investigations, but we, we are as accurate in diagnosis. We use less prescribing of medications, less investigations, so we're cheaper and we generally have better quality of life outcome. We get our our patients participate in more activity or they get a more of a biopsychosocial approach. And um, so it's better, it's equal then or better to surgical care. And then other physiotherapists for patients who need surgical care, they're showing that physiotherapists are equal to consultants in assessing who actually needs surgical care. So in Ireland, physiotherapists, and also the same in the UK, physiotherapists now can place people directly on surgical lists because it's seen that they're as accurate in diagnosing. So our neurosurgical physios in advanced practice can place directly on the list for injection therapy or do the injection therapy or straight for neurosurgery directly without consulting with the consultant now because they're seen to be as accurate in diagnosing. So I don't believe we should be comparing advanced practice with other forms of physiotherapy. It's just, it's a higher level of practice. It's more, it's more advanced. Thanks. Rina, do you think, did, did, because you're, you're also, the CSP is also a union uh, organization, right? Yeah. So do you see that uh, it affects uh, the pay in a, in a substantial matter? Is that yeah, I think this is one of the challenges around the data because what it's a level of practice. It doesn't equate to a job role. So there is variation in terms of, um, there's local variation in terms of where these advanced practitioners, um, their rate of pay. So we have within the National Health Service, we have uh, pay bans. So some in some organizations, uh, advanced practitioners may be paid at a, a band seven. In others, it might be a band eight. So there isn't that there isn't that sort of consistent approach to how we employ advanced practitioners, and so that makes it uh, challenging from an equity point of view, and also from a, a retention point of view. Because quite frankly, if you can get paid more to do the same next door, then you're going to move. Um, so I think that is a that is a an ongoing challenge, and I think when it comes to collecting data, because we don't have that consistency of how it's applied, 
um, it, it's hard to, to get that consistent approach to data collection. Thanks. And Charlotte, you're also uh, a union organization, right? Mm, yes, we are. So, and this is, as I said before, so we, we, we want this, the specialization to be a ground for a career pathway and a higher salary. And what we have noticed in the more recent years, it is that when the employer, and that's increasing, are asking for a specialist, then, then there is the, the uh, possibility to have a higher salary, of course, increases. Yeah. So, yeah. Thanks. And Tara, what would you say that uh, it is in the, in the US? Yeah, this is a little bit more of a challenge. We see, we have data on, but it, think of them as like a series of one-offs, right? So there's different um, papers that have been done looking at board certified specialists compared to non-specialists and different things that they do more efficiently, more effectively, which can translate to dollars, but it doesn't translate into reimbursement. The reimbursement is the same regardless, but, but the demonstration project is to say they actually are more efficient and effective. Um, we're not we're at, we now have expanded into primary care, what they call primary care physical therapy, um, and also emergency departments. And those are the places where I think they're starting to demonstrate their worth as far as being um, cheaper and more effective um, to get the right care at the right time. And rather than seeing an e being in an emergency department and then um, waiting to see a physical therapist, that's who they see in the emergency department and cut cut that second visit and, and so on. Um, so I, I think we have the potential to, to get more of that data and it is emerging, um, but we don't have a real tiered system that we can look at backwards, right? That there's not that you get to do something someone else doesn't get to do so I can show that it was different. Um, and we're starting to see some challenges. There was recently a paper that just came out that's creating a lot of waves in our veterans affairs system at the, in the United States. And it was demonstrating nurse practitioners um, and they were not cheaper and they ordered more tests and they were less effective at diagnosis. And it was a, a pretty large study in a, in a closed system. So it was able to be followed in a different way. Um, and so we're gonna have to be really cautious that we actually can pull off all those things um, because they're, they're looking for demonstration that is not true. Thanks. So Alex is saying, uh, you have uh, another question. Ash, well, is I, keeping, Ash is keeping us busy. Uh, this yeah, evening. no, well, it was actually linked to that one um, where once uh, those who are in uh, the less of the insurance based uh, industry uh, were giving their answers. But it was actually also, you know, if you're in a, uh, a health um, insurance orientated system like in the Netherlands and obviously um, in the States, uh, is the reimbursement level the same or different for your advanced practice specialist, which Tara Joe has just uh, said for the states? And I wondered if who's if if you have different pay levels. Yes, yes. Ooh, there I am again. Yes, uh, uh, we definitely have different pay levels, although. Uh, not all of our specialists get differently different pay because uh, well that's really lo lobbying. So the bigger the bigger uh, specialists, so manual therapy is really big in the Netherlands. They get a higher reimbursement than uh, normal physiotherapists, uh, so the bachelors, um, uh, pediatric as well. Uh, but we also have uh, specialists on the master's degree who do not get an added. Uh, uh, an add-on on, on their reimbursement. So, for example, the psychosomatic physiotherapists do not get a higher reimbursement scheme, uh, and there are uh, several others. So, um, this is where we see the the lobbying towards the different insurance companies um, pays off. And uh, obviously, lobbying is uh, easier when you have a, a a bigger apparatus. If you have more members, and for example, uh, manual therapy is. Uh, uh, really big in the Netherlands. I don't know. I, I, I think it was Marie who said it's like 8% uh, of the PTs who is specialized. Well, in the Netherlands, it's uh, nearing the 40, so 40%, uh, of which many of them are um, um, manual therapists. So, yes, there are different reimbursement schemes, mm -hmm. um, but there are also specialists who 
earn the same money as a normal bachelor's physiotherapist. Thanks. And, and Ash has posted a question to all panelists. Yep. Um, so that yeah. is asking um, if there are any tensions between other colleagues whose scope we are in some cases extending into advanced practitioner roles. So do other physiotherapists welcome the advanced practitioner roles within their specialty or within their, their, their area uh, or are there tensions? Charlotte, do you yeah. want to go first? No, I don't think we have met any of that. So it's our um, um, professional groups in Sweden who are a part of the association who, who, who do these the, the guidelines for the speciality. And we have about 70% of our officials are members. So I think it's quite, no, we, we haven't met any of that actually, no. Mm -hmm. Rina, what would you say in the in the UK? Are there any tensions? Uh, so yes, this question has been posed by my boss. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you better you better give a good oh, answer. Then. Yeah, I know. I think the first thing to say, I think, is understandable because what we're talking about here is change, and so with with that transformation, there are going to be inherent tensions. But we have to think about the service user and what what is best for the service user. And what we have to acknowledge is now uh, team leaders are working across multi professional teams, and there is that there is that blurring of roles. And actually, that might be okay. For, in some instances for some service users. So I think we have to think about the service user at the heart of this and build that service around their needs. And that might mean, you know, some, some changes. And I think if we think of it as a Venn diagram where you've got what you bring as a profession, what others as a profession bring, and what's the sweet spot, there will be things that we share. I mean, somebody said something around shared mutual cases. Yeah, there will be. But actually, by working together, maybe we can optimize what we bring as individuals. So I think it's yes, there are tensions. I don't think we should be afraid of that. Uh, but we just need to rethink our service models to reflect the, the changing needs of our population. Thanks. And Marie? Um, I think the experience in Ireland has been very positive because we locally Uh, Marie, we can't hear you for you because your audio is gone. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Thanks. Okay, sorry. I said, I think it, it has generally been, like Rena, it's been a, a positive. There are some tensions, but it's been very positive. A lot of the services that developed initially, developed locally, purposed, had a very good working relationship with the local consultant. So they work together very well. We have broad scape support of our consultant colleagues the national clinical programs and they're actually helping us support support us with legislation change as well and um, we have advanced practice nursing in ireland and and generally ireland is a small place everybody knows everybody so once you develop those communication skills and work in a team together it seems to go well i know when i started my role there was a little bit of what's she coming in who's is she going to take the, my role or this role but when they saw what i was bringing differently it, it worked and also it comes very much down to your communication and being open with people. Face some tensions as we move into primary care, because I don't think GPs know our model as well as our hospital consultants. But I think, again, it'll all come down to the individuals that, that start working them, that working with them. Um, and then the ISCP will have to do a strong lobby to explain what this is about. Um, to alleviate any tensions, we will have a very strong role there to be able to explain. But I, in Ireland, we have um, a new program of health reform. It's called Slauncha Care. It means health for everybody. And the, the focus of it, the slogan of it is right person, right place, right time. And that completely feeds into advanced practice. So the idea is that wherever the service user goes that they see the right person who can give them the right care so advanced practice really meets that so i think within the context of our national government plans yes we have broad support thanks and tara joe what would you say the state is in the u.s is there a tension between specialists and generalists 
You know, I think it, it when it first started, there was, I mean, I grew up when that happened. So like I first took it, the exam and was uh, I'm board certified in two areas. And it was definitely there was, you know, why is that any better? I, I do think that over, you know, 30 plus years, that's really faded away a bit. I think the probably the tension we have now is demonstrating that it actually has additive value either to the physical therapist or to the system at large. Um, and so again, we have a, you know, we still only have 30,000 people people who are certified. So that's, you know, it's only 15% of all physical therapists. So we still have work to do now, I think, to, to push that further. But I think we're starting to look at what is its perceived value. And then we have singular papers on its applied value. It's starting to get to be a groundswell of, of data, but but the truth is we needed more people to be able to do it. 50% um, of all our board certified specialists are in orthopedics. So out of 30,000, 15,000 are in one area out of 10. So um, we need the, the critical mass of individuals to also start to demonstrate its value. Um, but I don't think there's consternation or, or a pushback in, at all anymore. I think it's, is this worth doing? And if so, why? So I definitely think we've switched from a, a maybe um, a negative perception early on um, with, you know, why is this, why are you better to, um, you know, what's the additive value for everybody to to continue this? And I think that's where we are now in, in 2023. Thanks. So I think that brings us to probably the most important question, which we kept for last, which is, has it approved, does it have added value both for for the uh, patients, for physiotherapy, and uh, uh, for healthcare systems, because we have we've had great expectations out of advanced care, advanced practice. Uh, what's experience been like? Has it really made a change? Who would you like to uh, start? Because you, I think you you actually have probably the, the biggest, largest data uh, out of everyone. Mute. Hi, uh, Jules yeah. asking is too difficult. Yeah, there I am again. No. Um, well, with regard to the advanced practice, uh, uh, at the sense of the what we call extended scope, we don't have that much experience with it. Um, but if we look at, uh, uh, which has been uh, talked about a little this evening, direct access, obviously we have really good um uh data and really good experiences with it um in which we see that over 50 percent of the um visits to a physiotherapist in the primary care um visit us directly um so yes there we have that, that's what we see as a part of our extended scope which we have since 20, 2006 so 2006 uh, and really helped uh, um, in providing us uh, an autonomous position and an increased number of patients. And then if we look at the specialty, um, uh, uh, so, sorry, again, what was the question on the, on the, with regard to the data near it you were asking? You're expecting me to remember my question. That's it. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. I was just. No, I was I was, I'm just know. saying that does it actually uh, um, a proven or was was the proven what we expected? Is it really changing? You feel it's changing uh, uh, or, or contributing as as expected to the healthcare system, to yeah. physiotherapists, and to the patients. Yeah. Well. Okay. So for direct access, yes, it did. Um, for advanced practice, in a broader sense as in other countries as the UK and, and USA and Ireland, we don't have any experiences yet. We hope to get them. Um, and with regard to the specialties, yes, it helped in uh, um, uh, creating better healthcare. And yes, in the beginning and sometimes still, we are now in the midst of uh, um, um, broadening our specialties with regard to the cardiovascular uh, physiotherapy. There, um, physios and patients had to get a, well, get to uh, become familiar with the special specialists, but uh, from the perspective of um, pediatric physiotherapists, manual therapists, and other specialists, uh, obviously these are only two examples. It helped in uh, improving the healthcare we provide as physiotherapists, and uh, there have been lots of publications about it um, uh, as well, um, focusing on the. Uh, 
um, intermittent collocation. We have very nice examples in the Netherlands and also on, um, although uh, the data is changing on that, on the, um, on the coach to move. So how to treat elderly patients. Um, first, this was focusing on only the geriatric uh, specialization, but now it, as um, our colleagues from the US explained, where sometimes you move towards specialism and then you move away from it. So um, yes, it helps in, in one way, moving towards specialism. We mainly see this in uh, cardiorespiratory specialists and obviously manual therapy in pediatrics. And uh, in the example of the um, uh, geriatric, this geriatric program, first it was uh, hypothesized that only specialists could uh, uh, provide such program, but now it's moving away from specialization again. So yes, it did. Good. Charlotte, I remember a few years ago, we had a talk, I can't remember exactly where the talk, I remember you being frustrated about uh, the whole process. How is it going on? How do you think it is now in Sweden? Well, we, we, are, uh, we are getting forward. Uh, so I just wanted to, to add another perspective about the specialization, at least in Sweden. So we also see it as a, as a part of the lifelong learning. So that the, the speciality education, it offers an, an uh, opportunity to uh, a structured and, and quality assured education based on the need of the healthcare services. So, and, and, and that's, that has been a perspective that has um, grown the, the, the recent years. So healthcare is, is changing so fast. So the, the, we see a need to have a structure in the lifelong learning. And that's what the, the, the specialist education is really can, can, can offer. So that's quite important for us to, uh, and an important part of the work. Thanks. Uh, and Rina, has it uh, delivered what it promised to do? Yeah, I think that the, the perspective, just to follow on from Charlotte, actually, is around that the opportunity for workforce development um, and also links in near it with the point you were making about retention. So we know that staff retention is, is high on the agenda for many services. And this, you know, we are attracting very talented people into our profession and we want to keep hold of them and the, these opportunities provide that career pathway um, to kind of advanced level consultant level practice so I think it serves us as a profession in terms of optimizing our capabilities it's retaining that talent within our, our profession as well um, and um, I think what you know the what we're looking for is that development across the four pillars of practice leadership system leadership so we need these individuals to then start influencing at that system level in terms of transformation of services uh so yes i think it's still still we've still got a way to go but i think we're well on the way thanks uh marie Would you say it it actually did what you expected it to do in Ireland? I am um, so we do have some data on this. Um, so what I would so what we know is that waiting times for people seen by advanced practitioners in orthopedic waiting to see orthopedic appointments or rheumatology has gone from four years to three months because of the physiotherapists. So that's a, a, a massive saving. So we know for the patients that they're getting seen much faster and, and and because they're being seen faster and earlier in their journey their outcomes we're looking at that now outcome measures their outcome measures are better and um, because they're being seen earlier in their journey they're not they're not as as long with their pain or or their their issue we also see anecdotally pay, physiotherapists are telling the service that they're they're much happier to stay in employment because they see a pathway and we absolutely know that we are cost saving. And um, so we know that 65 physios over 10 years have taken over 200,000 patients off waiting lists. And we we believe that patients are being seen by the appropriate person that if, because only 20 percent of those patients actually need to get referred on to a consultant. They never needed a surgical opinion in the first place. 
you know so we believe that the physiotherapist is the right person to manage these patients and and that's what's happening it's the same in our ed so in our emergency department waiting time so the big thing in emergency department is wait time so where they're seen by the average the guideline in ireland is ed and in one of our hospitals it was around eight hours but when they were seen by the physiotherapist it was halved so they're being seen within four hours if they're seen by a physiotherapist instead of waiting for a medical consultant and also we're we've done some length of stay work looking at um length of stay in hospitals and when they were seen by the advanced practitioner for um, COPD they were they left hospital two days earlier so we have data around that as well there's um, a physio who was triaging them with COPD at the door when they came in first so she was managing their whole pathway and the length of stay was um was two days shorter so there was significant cost savings so we believe Definitely, it, it, having done it myself, it is a very satisfactory role. There's a huge amount of, you get a lot back from it, not only from the value you deliver to the patients, but from your clinical autonomy and, and seeing yourself grow. We know without a doubt we are saving cash. Like we've, we've done the cost studies here. We are saving cash for the for the health service and all the patients that we've surveyed are really, really happy. Um, their patient journey is shorter. They're seeing less people. That was really important as well during COVID when you were trying to see less clinicians. They're accessing services faster. They're being seen earlier in their journey. Now we're moving into primary care. So they won't have to come into a tertiary level or a secondary level hospital. They'll be managed locally. So definitely... It, it is not the level all physiotherapy should aspire to. It, it, we don't have that patient population that everybody needs to do this. But for a certain percentage of the population, it will manage them very, very well. And we will be able to support our medical colleagues and our nursing colleagues in delivering services for the, the right service for the service user, which, as Rena said, is, is the centre focus of all of this. Thanks. Alex, are there any more questions? Uh, no more questions in the chat. Um, I've got a bit of a question, though. Um, so thinking about countries where maybe they're not as advanced, so, um, you know, that the, the physiotherapy is still, uh, you know, specialisms, but not really going on to advanced practice. Are there any kind of pitfalls or things that you would just say watch out for if you're starting to develop this kind of a, um, uh, an advancement of the, of the profession? Anyone? No, be, be, no I was going to yeah. say, be, be excellent in your communication right from the start. Communication is key. Communication with the medical practitioners about what you want to do, hierarchical barriers, communication with the government. If you are starting, start small. Give yourself a very specific scope and and prove what you can do in that area. That's the way we did it. And then we expanded the number of conditions we could see. But we developed that confidence and that trust through communication initially. If you can standardize, I don't say standardize practice, but have a set of standards, it's, it's easier. But I, I think if these things do develop generically develop locally and then you get kind of a now but once you get that national impetus try and look framework um I, I think that's been very valuable for all to the government to show that we do have a framework of capabilities and a certain level of practice that the, the public can expect from us thanks anyone else want to add to that I would just say, yeah, um, that that really I, I read the last part resonates with me is, is things like what we have, like descriptions of specialty practice, like what is it exactly that is the advanced components of knowledge, skills and abilities that an individual would be doing in these areas and really having that defined and, and trying to be really sure that that's not already generic to everyone, that it's not entry level, that it really is advanced. And so really trying to define that in a way before you launch into it to be sure that you're defining something that's unique. Thanks. Anyone else? Right. So anyone else want to add from the panelists anything before we uh, say uh, goodbye? Okay. So 
I, I would like to thank first uh, Miguel who organized all of uh, the event and, and, and did all of the work and uh, to all our panelists for a very, very interesting and informative uh, meeting. Uh, thank you for, give, for giving us the time and uh, the, the knowledge to educate us, uh, all of us. And I think we have a, a lot to think about and I think it will be very helpful for uh, countries going through this process. Esther Marie, you would like to say something? Yeah. Um, thank you, Neeraj, and, and, and thank you to all of the panel. Um, I think it's been a really interesting debate. I just wanted to say that we put up, and thank you to Miguel, we put up our European paper, um, our statement on advanced practice. We've put it up in the chat, and also we've put all our contacts there in terms of our website. This talk will be on the YouTube channel, and also hopefully all of you will follow us on, on Twitter, and uh, and and Facebook. So I just wanted to reach out to people and uh, promote the uh, the uh, um, your interest in this uh, in the European region as 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 well. Um, thank you, Neeraj. Thanks, and uh, good night. It's been uh, really interesting. Bye bye.